Thank you. Thanks so much, Sam. And thanks for making this uh, series of lectures possible here at the Public Library. So this is the first of three um, lectures I'll be giving this academic term. Uh, this one is titled The Power and Poverty of the Imagination. The next one, which is in uh, late October, I can't remember the exact date. It's also on a Saturday afternoon at 2 PM, uh, is titled Our Economy of Anxiety. And the third one, uh, which will happen uh, at the end of November, I think November 30th, is um, titled Our Age of Revenge. Um, and together, they represent a bit of a spectrum of some of the topics that I've been thinking about and researching for the last couple of years. Um, and it's a really great joy to be able to share them with, with you and also with uh, an audience who isn't with us here physically, but who will join us through the video that we're making of this today, which includes people who randomly happen upon the uh, website of the Reimagining Value Action Lab, which I run with Cassie Thornton uh, over at the uh, PACI building. Uh, we're a laboratory for the radical imagination, social justice, and decolonization. And I'll tell you at the end of my talk today a little bit about some of our upcoming other activities activities. Um, but also, uh, this uh, material that I'm recording now is also part of a course that I'm teaching at Lakehead University in Cultural Studies. Um, that is an online course, but has lecture components. So these three lectures are also part of that. And it's sort of in the spirit of bringing that to the public that uh, I'm, I'm here with you today. So thank you all for coming. Um, so as Sam mentioned, my position at Lakehead is the Canada Research Chair in Culture, Media, and Social Justice, a position I took up about two and a half or three years ago, um, largely based on the work I'd done in the past about the power of the imagination in our society. And I'll talk a little bit today about different ways of thinking about the imagination and defining it. I define it a little bit differently than probably the ways that you're familiar hearing about that word. Um, but my exploration of the imagination in my career as an academic and also as an activist has really been motivated by two major areas of interest. So these are a couple of the texts that I've written. Um, on the left, you have uh, a book that I've been working on for many years called Cultures of Financialization, Fictitious Capital in Popular Culture and Everyday Life, which is a long-winded academic way of saying that I was interested in where imaginary money comes from. Those of us who remember the 2008 financial crisis recall when trillions and trillions of dollars seemed to disappear overnight. And the question was, well, where did all this money go? And where did it come from? And also, if you zoomed out and looked at the Earth as if from space, you would have a hard time saying that that money was ever real to begin with. Because though you know, one day there was trillions of dollars in the stock market and the next day there wasn't, very little actually changed in the material basis of our reality. It's not like, you know, thousands of skyscrapers disappeared or all of the mines shut down, regrettably, that didn't happen. Uh, or, you know, or the economic capacity of humanity somehow lessened overnight, as if by a magical spell. But something certainly happened, and whatever that something was had incredible effects on all of us, had effects on the economy, on society. In that example of the 2008 financial crisis, thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of people in the United States especially lost their homes to foreclosures. So there was a real effect. But something about all of that strange financial money floating around in the economy, uh, I suggested, should give us pause to think about the role of the imagination in everyday life and the role of the imagination in the capitalist economy of which we're a part. We'll come back to that a little bit later in this conversation. So on one hand, I'm interested in where imaginary money comes from. And I'm interested in how it is that we can imagine certain things are valuable to the point of being invaluable in our society, like, for instance, money, where certain things are rendered worthless, which are obviously very valuable, for instance, forests or farmland or people's homes, all the sorts of things that get rendered worthless in our capitalist economy, the labor of people, the labor to care for one another, all of these things that are devalued in our society. My question is, well, how is it that we imagine that some things which are obviously not very worthwhile in most of our lives, like a credit default swap or a, you know, a, a financial instrument, how come those become incredibly vastly valuable in our sort of shared imagination 
while so many important things about the world that we share together are rendered worthless and therefore exploitable. And so many people are rendered worthless and therefore exploitable in our society. On the other hand, I'm interested in how people reject, rebel, and uh, seek to restore other modes of thinking about who and what is valuable. And that's work that I've done in a set of, uh, sort of inquiries around what I call the radical imagination. What is it that allows people to rise up and reject the situation that they find themselves in? What allows them to think outside of the given parameters of the culture that they have been brought up in and to determine that they or their communities have value when they've been told their entire lives that they're worthless? These are the questions of the radical imagination, which I'll come to a little bit later in this presentation. Uh, to cut a long story short, my notion of the radical imagination isn't something that we have as individuals. That's sort of inside of our brain, and I'll explain why in a moment. I speak about the radical imagination as something that we share and that we cultivate together. So it may be true that we each have an individual imagination in our minds, our mind's eye, so to speak, and we'll talk about that in a second. But to a very real extent, our ability to imagine that things could be dramatically different, that the world could take a different form, that we could have a different society that actually cared for and, and prized people rather than money and the accumulation of wealth, that is something we generate together. And in fact, in a certain way, that's what we're doing here. And that's why libraries are such important institutions. They allow us to come together in events like these, or simply in the institution itself, to dream together that the world could be different. And that the, the architecture of value that we live in could be dismantled and rebuilt along fairer, more just lines. In recent work, I've tried to examine the way that artists are thinking through these questions on the one hand of the financialized imagination, the imagination of money, and on the other hand, the radical imagination. I recently published a book called Art After Money, Money After Art, which is, looks at about 50 different artists from around the world, mostly from Europe and North America, but also some from outside of those zones, who are trying to rethink the economy and giving us the tools to rethink what it means to live together and cooperate as a human species, and also to challenge the norms of value and the economy as such that exists today, based as it is on the exploitation of people and the planet. So if I were to ask a neuroscientist to locate the imagination, uh, they would be flummoxed, because as much as neuroscience has taught us about the nature of the human brain, over the last few decades, and the developments are indeed remarkable and very insightful, they have yet to pinpoint this strange force in our minds that we all know and have known since childhood, that we know as well as any other part of our cognition, any other part of our minds, and yet which defies categorization and location. You can't remove the imagination with a scalpel. Uh, those who have suffered brain injuries don't lose the capacity for imagination, although their imaginations may be altered. The imagination, then, is something that exists not in a particular location of the brain, but in between all the other locations. It's not the words in the dictionary. It's the syntax of our mental language. It's what connects everything. It's what connects memory to impulse. It connects impulse to thinking and the, the sort of rational frontal part of the mind. It's what allows us to take in sensory information from our senses and combine that with our memories and our understanding of the world to create an impression. And importantly, imagination is what allows us to think about what might happen in the future. This incredibly powerful ability that we have as human beings to think through not only what the future will hold, but the many possibilities in front of us in the future, what might happen in the next few seconds. While I've been spending here spe speaking to you, it, there's been a lot of interesting neuroscientific experiments that reveal that essentially, though you're sitting here listening to me, and perhaps what I'm saying to you is new to you, on the level of language itself, you are actually anticipating every word. You anticipated the word, word, before I spoke it. Your mind had already completed the sentence in most cases. And that's because our minds are calibrated to living with sort of one foot, so to speak, in the future. That's the work of the imagination in its everyday sense. We're able to project ourselves and project our experience into the future. 
But the imagination also allows us to do other incredibly vital things as well. For instance, the fundamental human capacity for empathy, which is really the thing that stitches our society together, that allows us to care for each other, that allows us to provide care for those in need. And at one point, we were all in need as infants, and we will all be in need at some point in the future. We all need care. Our ability to care for one another is based on the power of the imagination, too. If you are you know, taking care of an infant, the infant can't express in language what it needs. You have to imagine what the infant needs. And in that basic act of the imagination is the sort of secret to the thing that we might have once called human nature, the ability to work together, to build, to create, to reproduce. So the imagination is somehow vital to our minds, to our mental life, to our ability to care for one another, to our ability to build a society together, to our ability to cooperate with one another. And yet, it's something that, try as we might, it's very difficult to define. Every definition that has been provided or suggested eventually runs aground, because it's such an intimate part of our mental experience. In fact, arguably, the imagination itself, this thing, this word we use to describe this quality of mind, is itself dependent on the imagination. It is something that we imagine in our minds. If I ask you to imagine the imagination, your mind goes through a kind of real um, stress test because you're using the very capacity to try and understand that capacity. So the imagination, in one sense, is something that defies our ability to categorize and represent. Because it's a, it, it, it is so intimate and so, de, so crucial to our ability to categorize and represent. And yet at the same time, it holds a place in our language and in our culture. When we talk about the imagination, we're not just talking about a quality of mind or some cerebral process, some action of the brain. When we use the word imagination, it's tied up with our hopes and our dreams. It's tied up with what we think might be possible. I got interested in the imagination because I was curious as to why more people weren't rising up against the circumstances that they find themselves in. Why there's so much political quietism in our culture. Why so many people feel that the system that we have right now, in spite of the fact that it's destroying most of our lives, it's destroying the planet, it's based on exploitation and ecological destruction. Why more, so many people seem to accept that. So the question that led me to the inquire about the imagination was this question of why is it so hard for people to imagine anything different? Why do we accept the ideological message that there is no alternative to the system we live under? And why can't we imagine that things would be different? And so in that sense, the imagination for me and for many others is tied up to our aspiration for what we want to be able to do as a species, as a society, as individuals. And further, when we talk about the imagination today, we're often talking about it in contrast to a lot of other things. So we're usually talking about it in contrast to the absence of the imagination. When we think about what it would mean to lead a life of the imagination, we compare it to, for instance, a life of boredom or a life where our imaginations are actively destroyed by, let's say, popular culture, or more accurately, are often destroyed by the fact that we, many of us have to work extremely alienating jobs where we simply do what we're told for 8 to 10 to 12 hours a day, maybe multiple part-time, temporary, minimum wage jobs that leave very little time or scope for our imaginations. So when we speak about the imagination, we're always speaking about something that we aspire to, something that we desire, something that we hope for. It's a word that's bound up in our aspirations and dreams as much as it is in any particular categorical definition of what this thing is. So we have to move away then from understanding the imagination as a quality of the brain, as interesting as those inquiries can be, and instead take a historical reading of what the imagination is. The word imagination uh, stems, as you might imagine, from the notion from Latin that we, Im we create images in our mind, the capacity to produce an image of the future or of something we can't see or qu can't understand in our brains. And as you might imagine, for this reason, over the centuries, the imagination has been very fearsome and uh, distrusted by those in power. This is a picture of the destruction of the Vendome Collis by the Paris Commune in the 1870s when the working class of, of Paris rose up uh, at the end of the Franco-Prussian War and declared their ownership of the city that they'd built. Um, a, quite an amazing historical episode. Uh, but I put it here simply to note that the rich and the powerful for whom the society works, 
for, who benefit from the way that society is organized. The imagination, and especially the imagination of the oppressed, is a very dangerous thing. Because if those who have been oppressed and abused and uh, exploited come to imagine that the system is not necessary, that those who claim to have power are not legitimate, that their wealth that they enjoy is stolen, then it becomes the fuel that can ignite a rebellion. In the Middle Ages, the term imagination was often associated by elites with an actual crime, uh, which was to imagine the death of the regent or the king. So it was treasonous. There was a sense that imagination was extremely dangerous to the social order, so much so that the main use of the term would have been in legal jurisprudence to name this uh, horrific idea that you could imagine the death of the king, who of course in those times was imagined to be in a divine being, endowed by God with the right to rule. So the imagination and the ability to imagine was highly distrusted socially. But as modernity advanced, European imperialism and colonialism advanced, the enlightenment came to the fore, the imagination was reframed. So a famous phrase here from the 1820s from Percy Bysshe Shelley sums up the kind of optimism about the imagination that came to become quite normal in the late 1700s and early 1800s. Shelley wrote, a man, and it's important to recognize that Shelley was actually thinking almost exclusively about men, uh, to be greatly good must imagine intensely and incomprehensively. He must put himself in the place of another and of many others. The pains and pleasures of his species must become his own. And famously, he wrote, the great instrument of moral good is the imagination. And poetry administers to the effect, to, the, uh, to moral good, by acting upon the cause that is the imagination, from his defense of poetry in 1821. So at this moment, Western philosophers and writers began to lionize the imagination, not as this thing that should be distrusted because it could upset the social order, but because it meant that the ability to change the world rested in the mind and the soul of the individual. The capacity to dream broadly, to empathize with others, to foresee things that don't yet exist but could exist, were the means by which humanity could claim ownership over the world and could claim a sense of agency, that their fate was not set by God, that their fate was not set by nature, but that humanity had the right to control its fate. And there's something, of course, very appealing and very important about this perspective. And it's one that, to a certain extent, we need to hold on to, this optimism around the imagination. But of course, as this quotation in and of itself implies, and some of the words that I've been using to describe it also imply, there's a very dark side to this as well. Because what it essentially licenses is an idea that those who are said to be endowed with the imagination have the right to dominate the world and to dominate other human beings who are considered not to have an imagination. If humanity is defined by the ability to imagine broadly and to conceive of an effect of our activity before it comes to pass, and if that then licenses us to take command of the natural world, then all of those people and all of those things that are deemed not to have an imagination or to be deficient in the imagination are ours to conquer and ours to command. So a very dangerous ideology at work here. Because of course, this thing we call nature is not imagined to have an imagination. The earth is not imagined to have an imagination in this worldview. Those become resources for humanity to use and abuse at our will. And further, at this time, as this quotation implies to you, women and people of color were not considered to have sufficient imaginations to allow them to be enrolled in full humanity. Of course, in 1820s, women were not considered full citizens. They were largely, for legal reasons, considered property of men in their family, husbands, brothers, fathers. And women at this time, and for a very long time, have been considered to have sort of an ironic double deficiency of the imagination within the sexist and patriarchal imaginary. On the one hand, women were, it was suggested, too prone to the imagination. 
that their minds would run away with them, that their testimony couldn't be trusted, that they were not adequate to becoming scientists and authors and other contributors to, to society because their imaginations would overpower their rational mind. And yet at the exact same time as that belief was held in place, there was another belief as well, which is that only great men, and especially sort of great white ruling class men like Shelley, or you know, Shakespeare, Longfellow, or Tolstoy, or Goldsmith here, our buddies, uh, only they had the, the scope of imagination to actually be able to create something new. It was only through the great breadth of their specialized genius imagination that the true imagination could come to the fore. So women were held to both be lacking in imagination and also too prone to the imagination. And this idea of this, this kind of uh, ironic or um, juxtaposition of the imagination was also attributed to people of color, whole civilizations. So as Europeans began to be licensed by this notion of the imagination enabling them to conquer the world and enslave or colonize other peoples, they also began to project this pathology of the imagination onto their others, onto the people that they colonized. So those who were colonized around the world were seen on the one hand to be far too susceptible to the imagination. Their spiritual practices or religions were deemed to be flights of fancy in contrast to the Christian religion of Europe or the rational uh, uh, worldview of the Enlightenment. Peoples from around the world, their cultures were considered to be vastly too imaginative, that they believed in magic and witchcraft, that they believed in gods that didn't exist. The imagination had run away with them. And because they were so susceptible to the imagination, they therefore needed to be brought in hand and conquered <coughs> and ruled by European civilization. And at the same time, as that belief was present, there was another seemingly contradictory belief, which is that those people would never be able to achieve a level of imagination like Europeans, that they were locked in a prehistory, that they would never be able to achieve great works of art and literature and writing, that they would never be able to control the imagination enough to become rational. So the imagination and our theory of the imagination was used for these very dark purposes as well as triumphant as it was. Nonetheless, throughout European history, the notion of the imagination has been very, very important also for uprisings. And often these uprisings were against the sense that modernity and capitalism specifically was turning all of society and all people into automatons and machines. The sense that everything was reduced to its ability to make money or to have an instrumental purpose for someone else. That the world was increasingly oriented towards profit, towards progress, but what was being lost was the fundamental soul of social relationships or our relationship to the natural world or our relationships to the deeper emotional lives that we might lead. And so throughout this period of modernity, from the moments that I mentioned in the early 1800s, right up to the 20th century, there was a sense that the imagination could be a source of rebellion against a world that was becoming a machine, a source to reclaim our individuality and our ability to define for ourselves what the world would be like. Some of this most famously came to the fore in the rebellions of 1968 now 50 years ago, 51 years ago, uh, especially in France, where for various reasons that are too boring to get into here and now, but we can talk about it a little later, the imagination played a very important role in how people conceived of their rebellions. So here is a poster that was, that was wheat pasted around Paris to condemn the police assaults on protesters during these huge uprisings of workers and students in the late 60s that almost brought down the French government. Uh, it's hard to translate this exactly, but I mean, essentially one meaning of it is they can't beat the imagination. Um, or we don't beat the imagination. You can't, you can't sort of torture the imagination. It won't be defeated. Here, uh, a, a desire for, uh, sometimes this is translated as all power to the imagination or a, a desire for the imagination to take power. There was a sense in the 1960s in the protest movements in France and also around the world, here in Canada, in the United States, in England, and many, many other countries, that the imagination could be this force that would allow us to re, 
design society together. And that, in fact, the ability of the system of the day to perpetuate itself had so much to do with the repression of the imagination, with forcing us to simply go to work and enter into our routines and accept the social reality we lived in as necessary. But that if we could liberate the imagination together somehow, we would be able to uh, redesign and reimagine uh, society completely. So the imagination has for a long time been seen as this means by which we might challenge the status quo. But today, and this is why I've titled this lecture The Power and Poverty of the Imagination, today something very interesting has happened, which is that we've seen a very unique shift in our social reality, where imagination is no longer seen simply as this sort of dangerous, radical thing, but has actually been brought very close to the center of the capitalist economy of which we're a part. Now, a couple of definitions, just uh, to be clear. Capitalism is a system of human cooperation. We're a cooperative species. We need to cooperate to survive. We need to cooperate and we need to have a kind of division of labor so that different people do different jobs and we all contribute together to the greater good. That's the way that we've organized our many, many different types of societies over the great span of human, the human experiment. There are different ways of organizing our cooperation. The way that I would like to see us organize our cooperation is one that's highly democratic, where we all get together and we decide what sort of work we're going to do and how people should be remunerated. I think we could have a society where we organized our cooperation as human beings in a much fairer and more just way. That is unfortunately not the norm in many human civilizations. Unfortunately, throughout history, we have tended to see that small groups tend to dominate. And those small groups do two things. The first is that they tell everyone else how to cooperate. So they tell everyone else what to do, how to work. And those groups, those small elite groups, reap the rewards of that cooperation. So if I, like we were all on a desert island right now, and I was going to, would, I would use some sort of force or coercion to make you all work for me. And then I wouldn't work. I would just take all the stuff that you guys make, like all of the food and all of the shelter and all, everything else that we need on the desert island. And then I would probably hire a few of you to help enforce my rule. Capitalism is one such system. It's one such system with a very specific difference that's different from any other system that's existed. And that is that under capitalism, the means by which everyone's cooperation is organized is money. And the ends of that cooperation is also money. So let me break this down quickly. Um, why do you go to work every day? Well, hopefully some of you love work, the work that you do, and you're very fortunate. I happen to love the work that I do, but I'm a, my, I'm a very small minority of people. Most people go to work because if they don't go to work, they won't get paid. And if they don't get paid, they won't be able to pay the rent, and they won't be able to buy food. Etc. Etc. So there's a disciplinary power of money in our society that compels us to cooperate in certain ways. It compels you to go to Tim Hortons and work for a day. It compels me to go to the university. We get paid, and we buy the products of everyone else's labor, everyone else's cooperation. Why do we do it? Well, there is a small elite around the world who benefit from our work and make huge profits and are billionaires, the people who own the major businesses and chains, the people who own the major utilities, the people who own the huge corporations. But if you sat down with them and said, well, why do you do it? They would say, well, it's nice to be rich, but really, if I didn't do this, I would quickly be replaced by somebody else who did do it. Because the purpose of a corporation, which is the main organized thing that organizes our society, is to make money. And if I said, well, you know what, I'm not going to make as much money, I'm going to treat my workers nicely and not let them, you know, and, and give them shorter hours and whatever, you can imagine that if you did that as a CEO of a major corporation, you'd be fired and replaced very quickly. So in a certain sense, the whole system is organized by money, and it's organized to produce more money. That's capitalism as a system, in a nutshell. 
We live in a very specific moment of capitalism, which we call neoliberalism. Neoliberalism is an is a, is a aspect of capitalism that began about 40 years ago now, in the 1970s. You can read Naomi Klein's uh, book, uh, The Shock Doctrine. It's a very good description of where neoliberalism comes from. It emerges out of violence, out of state terrorism, horrible history in Chile and elsewhere. But ne neoliberalism is the idea that governments should get completely out of the way of capitalism and that money should rule all of society as much as possible. This takes a few different forms, which will be familiar to you today. One of them is the privatization of public services, like libraries. A neoliberal perspective would say that if the library is indeed valuable, then people should pay for it. It shouldn't be a public institution that's paid for by tax dollars. We should lower the taxes on the rich, cut the library, and if people really like the library, then they should pay for it either as a service or as a charity. That's a neoliberal perspective on social institutions. Neoliberalism is also defined by deregulation. So this is the idea that if, gov if uh, corporations aren't limited by government regulations, they'll do better. So you know the paper mill here. If there weren't all of those pesky environmental and labor regulations, that place would be doing great because it could abuse the environment and abuse workers as much as it wanted, and have, then that way have great prices. And that would create jobs, and things would be great. What's that? How long? <laughs> For this talk? How long am I going to speak? Or yeah. mm, probably about ten more minutes, I imagine. <laughs> but you don't need to stay. You can you can go and come back later. Yeah, yeah. Please do what do what you want to do. Um, so there's a broad culture. Um, but the other aspect of neoliberalism that's important to remember is that there's been a huge cultural transformation, a huge cultural shift that's happened as well in our own minds and our own imaginations and our own sense of what it means to live in a society. We no longer imagine that we're even part of a society. We're encouraged by this neoliberal shift to imagine that we're all individuals and that we must compete with one another to survive. There's been a fundamental shift in our worldview that's happened over the last 40 years that was not even the case in earlier moments of capitalism. Now, interestingly, one of the key pieces of the shift in this worldview has been a shift in the way that we understood creativity and the way that we understand art and artists. As the cultural critic Angela McRobbie put it almost 30 years ago now, artists have become the pioneers of the new economy. Once upon a time, we thought of artists as these kind of romantic, mistempered figures of rebellion who tended to drink themselves to death in Paris, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, no more. Now, artists and the ideal of the artist is offered to everyone as the model that we should emulate. So if work in neoliberal society is becoming more precarious, more part-time, more temporary, more exploitative, if there are fewer and fewer long-term jobs and long-term guarantees, then instead of rebelling against this and demanding that we care for people as a society, we should all, according to the neoliberal ideology, embrace the ethos of the artist who moves from contract to contract, who has the work-life loft where work and life have no barrier between them, whose network of friends and acquaintances are also people with whom they negotiate for economic gain. This notion of the artist that has come to the fore in the last 20 years especially is one that is calibrated to help us think that we can express our imagination and our creativity better than ever today. And indeed that it's our obligation if you are working multiple part-time jobs, the problem that is why you can't get ahead, according to the neoliberal ideology that we live under, is that you haven't embraced risk enough. You haven't found your passion and, you, and transformed that passion into an entrepreneurial venture which you then can compete with on the free market. You haven't seized your capacity. You haven't harnessed your passion to the engine of economic growth. And this is sold to us as a form of liberation. It's different than when you had to just go to the factory and work in the factory all day or work in the daycare center all day. That this new era of precariousness and competitiveness is a gift that allows us to express our creativity and our imagination more than ever. In a certain way, this has been emblematized or dramatized by the rise of the so-called creative industries. 
the creative industries is a name, a sort of an umbrella group that's been given to all sorts of different um, uh, forms of economic activity that have to do with people's creativity or through the production of intangible assets. So this is uh, propaganda from 2017 from the uh, government of the United Kingdom, which for the last 30 years has been very dedicated to the shift towards a quote unquote creative economy as, for instance, old industries are shut down and moved to countries where labor can be more easily exploited and people are increasingly out of work. So you can see that the creative industries include advertising, information technology, software games, architecture, design and fashion, publishing, film and television, and music, arts and culture, and crafts <laughs> down here. Uh, sorry, crafts. Uh, the, the, the idea here is that we could build a new economy based on everyone maximizing their creative output. And that a creative economy is more humane and more generous and more generative than, for instance, older forms of the economy. And there are a couple of good things about this and a lot of bad things about it. Everyone should have the opportunity to be creative and imaginative. That is a fundamental part of the human experience, and it should be a fundamental human right. The reality is that most of us never have those opportunities, and we have even fewer opportunities to have our creativity and imagination recognized, rewarded, and valued in this society. Typically, we have cultural industries, such as all of these, which reward the top 1% of the 1%. It's like the hockey draft, you know? You have thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of players whose parents and themselves spend millions and millions and millions of dollars collectively becoming the best player they can possibly be, and only 1% of 1% of those players are ever going to have a job in that game that is going to pay them even a modicum of the amount that they would uh, be able to recoup the costs of their initial investment. The same thing happens in most of the creative industries as well. You have millions and millions of people working away trying to make their contribution to the world, and we as a society only celebrate, lionize, and share the work of a tiny, tiny minority who become celebrities. But more than that, there's also a deeper question uh, about the rise of the creative economy, which is that obviously you can't have a world where everyone is an artist, right? Some people still need to grow food, some people still need to work in uh, factories. Some people still need to work minimum wage jobs. And according to many theories of the economy, a lot of people also need to be unemployed for the capitalist economy to work because it keeps all the rest of the workers scared that they will become unemployed. So it may be true that a country like the UK or Canada could have a high percentage of its population working exclusively in the creative industries. But that's only possible if there are other countries like, say, the Democratic Republic of Congo or the People's Republic of China, where a huge percentage of the population are working horrible, exploitative, body-destroying jobs in factories. So if we think about our experience as a species, as now we must do in an age of globalization, it becomes increasingly important for us to think through who gets to do the creative work and whose creativity gets recognized. But further, it's a lie. The reality is that most of the work that people do, even within the creative industries, is much more akin to the work of the sandwich artist at Subway than it is towards the you know, images that we may have of the romantic genius sitting in their loft drawing nudes. It's much more common that people working in the creative industries, whether it's film, television, publishing, or otherwise, are working jobs where they basically show up every day at 9 o'clock and get told what to do for eight hours and then go home, and where their actual creativity is not prized or valued. And that, more generally, is what is happening in the economy as a whole. We are all essentially now living the life of sandwich artists, which if any of you have worked at Subway or any other minimum wage job, you will know, despite the claims of the corporation that it's made with care by Ville, it, there's an instruction on how to make the sandwich, and if you don't make the sandwich exactly the way that every other sam Subway sandwich artist makes the sandwich, you are going to be fired that day on the spot. All it takes is one complaint. And to me, this represents the economy of uh, creativity and the imagination that we live with today better than anything else. So I've mentioned already that, to bring things towards a close here, that we are a cooperative species and that we cooperate with one another as a species through our imagination. If we all were going to turn these chairs into a structure that looked like a house, we would need to use communication and imagination 
to be able to do that. We wouldn't be able to coordinate and synchronize our imaginations about the thing we wanted to build together. We would need to be able to talk about what it is that we wanted to build, talk about the role that each of us is going to play in building that thing, and have a sense together of the shared future we wanted to create. That happens all the time in our lives. It happens when you talk with people that you live with about what your schedule for the day is going to be like. It's happening at every moment in our human experience. But this, of course, gives rise to many bad things as well. So one of them is the fact that our imaginations can become saturated and dominated by forces that are not working in our interests. And I've already mentioned at the beginning of this talk the way that money does this. right? So money, in a way, is this thing that totally captivates our imagination. Most of us judge our value, not on the basis of those who love us, on our ability to care for others, our ability to provide for our world. Most of us have been taught to value ourselves and others based on how much money you earn or how much money you have, or the things that money allows you to buy. And our entire society has been dominated by money to such an extent that it comes to be the kind of meta-imagination between us. It becomes the means by which we judge what is valuable and the means by which we coordinate our cooperation solely through this kind of pathological imaginary of money. Another pathology of the imagination is the pathology of racism. Racism is the notion that completely imagined differences between people are significant. That skin color, for instance, or the place where one originates from has some dramatic effect on what, how, what a person's capacities are or their fundamental nature. Racism is a kind of virus in the imagination. Now, it's important to distinguish racism as a specific historical phenomenon from prejudice or xenophobia, which maybe humans have experienced for a long, long time. Racism is a particular way of categorizing human life that was developed by European imperialists in the 18th and 19th century in order to break humanity into races, quote unquote. This is a completely artificial and imaginary construction, this idea of race. First, you can see it very clearly if you think about, quote unquote, the Asian race, right? Asia stretches all the way from Turkey to Japan and all the way down to South Asia and Southeast Asia. There's a vast diversity of culture and a vast diversity of genetic expressions within that territory. So there is no such thing as an Asian race, but there's no such thing as a, any other type of race either. It is a category we have imagined that allows us to segment humanity and segment them into a hierarchy, a hierarchy which we inherit from the kind of racist imaginary uh, flights of fancy that were developed to justify and legitimate colonialism and imperialism. So the imagination has such a power and such a grip on us that it can allow us to justify the most heinous atrocities that we as a species have ever committed. The destructions of whole peoples, massive acts of genocide, the enslavement of people for generations and generations, all become justified through these structures of the imagination, which though they are taken for real, are in fact something that we have constructed together and something that we constantly perpetuate, even to this day. And so to bring us to a close, I want to speak a little bit about the radical imagination then. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, the radical imagination is the notion, fundamentally, that things could be different, that we could organize society completely differently, that our system of value and who we value and what we value could be radically changed. That radical imagination, as I discussed with my colleague Alex Kasnabich in a project that we did for about six years in Halifax, Nova Scotia, where we worked with social movements of all different sorts, anti-racist movements, feminist movements, student movements, we discovered through that research that the imagination, the radical imagination, is not something that individuals have. It's not that you see the world and then you say, aha, things are wrong. I need to imagine a different reality. Our argument is that it's something that groups do together. It's what happens when we gather and debate and discuss, when we learn from one another, and most importantly, when we cooperate differently. Because when we cooperate differently, we need to imagine a different outcome for our actions. We need to imagine different sorts of relationships. We need to imagine different values between us. 
There's a vast difference between what happens in the exact same factory when it's run by a multinational corporation and a manager who enforces labor conditions on the, on the floor and disciplines workers and the exact same factory producing the exact same thing in the exact same machines when it's run cooperatively, when the workers get together and run it based on their own ideas of how things should run and also for their own benefit. So it's the way in which we cooperate that shifts our imagination. But at the same time, we need to shift our imagination in order to be able to cooperate differently, not only at the level of a factory floor, but also on the level of everyday life. And that's the kind of secret of the radical imagination. It's about cooperating differently. The greatest impetus for my radical imagination, and I think for many of our imagina radical imaginations here in Thunder Bay, is the challenge of decolonization and the resurgence of indigenous worldviews and indigenous protest in the last few decades. Because fundamentally, as we know, uh, indigenous people in Turtle Island, for the most part, didn't have a theory of private property where certain individuals got to dominate the land and not allow others to use it. There are many different indigenous civilizations, so I don't want to homogenize them all into one group. But one of the most amazing things about the indigenous resurgence that we are part of in our lifetime, which is unique, is the ability to learn from civilizations that organize themselves and organize their cooperation completely differently and imagine the world completely differently. And we're in a world historic opportunity to abandon the kind of racist myths of colonialism that somehow European civilization was vastly and necessarily superior to all others and had a right to dominate, displace, and rule, and instead to actually begin to build true relationships with the land and with one another based on a very different set of values. But I think that this ability to imagine a different world is not just coming from the intellectual encounter with indigenous civilizations that is now happening in places like libraries and universities, not as much as it should, but to a certain extent. It's coming from our experiences of working together in resistance. And again, I want to really stress that the radical imagination and our ability to imagine otherwise comes from our experiences of cooperating together in different ways. And that form of cooperation is happening on barricades. It's happening in street demonstrations. It's happening when we grieve the death of somebody who we are told was worthless, here in the city, for instance. It's happening when we come together in social movements to challenge the powers that be and to insist that another world is possible and that we are here to create it. And I think that that is happening now all across this, the territories we currently call Canada and across Turtle Island as people rise up against extractive industries, as they rise up against abuses. In ultimately, in conclusion, I want to insist that though we are told in propaganda that we are living in an age of unparalleled opportunities for the imagination, where each of us as a competitive individual is allowed to bring the fruits of our creativity to the marketplace and, have, and express it, and the excellence will rise to the top. The reality is, of course, very different. We live in an era where most of us work longer and harder for less for less security. Uh, we live in a world where the capitalist economy to which we are all forced to contribute is destroying the planet, as yesterday's climate strike helped us remember. And we're living in an era where we, in fact, are given almost no latitude to be creative or imaginative about the sort of society that we want to create. On the other side, however, we are in an age of uprisings all around the world, which will be the subject of the third talk that I give uh, in two months. And the radical imagination and the decolonial imagination is stronger than it has been in many generations. We know everything is going to change within our lifetimes. The question is how it will change rather than if it will change. And it's my hope that if we can think more creatively about the imagination and we can learn to respect and work with the imagination as a collective force, we can go some way to being part of the great struggles that will define the decades ahead.